All right. Um, great. I think we're ready to start. Uh, everybody's here. Uh, welcome. My name is Louis Toinard. I'm the admissions manager for the Department of Physical Therapy. Uh, and this is our uh, first uh, virtual info session of uh, fall. So welcome. Uh, before we start, I want to respectfully acknowledge that UBC's Department of Physical Therapy at the Vancouver Point Grey campus is lo located on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. UBC operations as well are located on the um, territories of the Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh peoples. And as a distributed program, we do have sites across the province, including at the University uh, uh, of Northern uh, British Columbia in Prince George, where the campus is located on the territory of the Klitlitene peoples who are part of the Carrier First Nations. Um, so now I'm just gonna go to a brief housekeeping notes. Um, so for now, uh, all participants are going to be muted. Uh, the q and period will be at the end. So. We just ask that you keep your questions for the end. We will uh, get to that uh, for sure. So joining us is Amy Ellis. She's the uh, MPT Fraser Valley Clinical Site Lead, as well as Rowley Fletcher. He is the MPT Victoria Academic Site Lead, uh, as well as Gary, who is the Student Services Officer, and uh, two of our students, Elena and Rachel, who uh, gracefully accepted to come here today to talk with everybody. Um, great, hi, those are students waving. Uh, so I'll hand it over to Rolly. Hi everyone and welcome. Thanks, Louis. Um, so I'll just go over a couple of slides about our program. So um, for, for those of you um, that aren't aware, just a bit of an intro on what is a physical therapist? Um, so physical therapists are primary care professionals. Um, essentially what that means is that people can come and see us without a referral. Uh, so many uh, physiotherapists work in private practice where people will book an appointment. Um, but obviously we also work in a variety of other settings where patients are referred to us as well. Um, again, depending where some of our colleagues end up working, some people might be very independent in very rural and remote environments. Um, and other people are in large urban centers um, and working in kind of big, large teams as, as part of interdisciplinary healthcare. Most of you or most people are, are very familiar with, with kind of the sports side of physical therapy or, or what we call the orthopedic side. So um, people may have gone to see physiotherapists to deal with sprains and strains um, and sports related injuries. But our, our profession is really quite broad. Um, and we work in a lot of interesting and different areas. Uh, I spent a large part of my career working with uh, patients that have dizziness, which would fall under neurosciences or neurophysiotherapy. Um, Amy, for example, has spent a large part of her career working with people with respiratory issues as a cardiorespiratory physiotherapist. And then we have all sorts of other kind of areas where physiotherapists can work, including going into management positions and, and other areas. Um, if we can just go to the next slide. So obviously, as physiotherapists, we work with patients and, and generally work with patients on their goals when we're thinking about being very patient centered. Um, but some of the general things that we consider important as physical therapists and some of the things that we're trained at is helping people improve and maintain their physical mobility and their independence help prevent, manage, and deal with pain and, and limitations and disabilities that may kind of impact their ability to uh, participate in daily life and activities. And then more of a general kind of public health role around improving overall fitness, health, and well-being. So how to become a physical therapist in British Columbia? So first of all, you need to graduate from a bachelor's program. There's also a variety of volunteer kind of expectations in order to apply to the program. Once you are successful in getting into a graduate program, um, you also have to pass a uh, kind of entry to practice exam. Uh, and currently British Columbia has an exam called the PCE, which has a variety of written and clinical components. And then during the program, 
um, that, that takes about 26 months. And during that 26 months, you will have five clinical placements where you'll go out there and work with other clinicians that are working and also start seeing your own patients and experiencing what it's like to practice as a physical therapist. So a brief overview of our program, it's two years or 26 months to be more accurate. It's a full-time professional master's degree and we cover over a thousand hours of clinical experience over five clinical placements. We are one of only 15 master of physical therapy programs in Canada and the only entry to practice physical therapy program in British Columbia. And as a program, we are accredited by the Physiotherapy Education um, Accreditation Canada. Our program works on a, on a continuum of education. And, and what I mean by that is that you, you learn certain skills and those skills and knowledge are developed throughout the program. So rather than having very specific courses and then moving on to a, a totally different course, um, the, the, the kind of content of the program builds throughout the program. So you might be learning some basic sciences and then the content will um, kind of go deeper as you move further into the program. Uh, again, you'll learn some basic skills on patient handling and things like that, some basic manual therapy skills, and then these skills progress in complexity as you go through the program. At the, the end of the program, we hope to graduate physiotherapists um, that are effective communicators, very reflective practitioners thinking about how they are interacting with patients and, and changing and making uh, different decisions moving forward, thinking very critically um, about how they practice and what, what uh, kind of treatments they perform, et cetera, et cetera. Um, this is just a very, um, uh, it's a busy slide, but it's just a bit of a visual. And I think what I'll do, just bring your attention to the green boxes first, because they're probably the most easiest. Um, so the green boxes are clinical placements. Um, what you're actually seeing here is the plan of the program with essentially the MPT-1 being across the top and then MPT-2 uh, second year of the program along the bottom. So the green squares are the kind of chunks where uh, students are out on placements working as a student physical therapist in some sort of clinic, uh, private clinic or public hospital setting. Um, and then the other chunks are really where, where people are at school engaging in the content and, and learning in the classroom and um, having some of those kind of core, core academic modules. And over to Amy. Thank you. So clinical education, which is the area that I uh, support students in primarily within my role. Um, Clinical placements are a time to experience a variety of practice areas, and this is what we really encourage is this um, diversity of experience as a student. Um, it's an opportunity to learn in different practice settings, uh, to also explore different geographical areas of the province, and we'll chat a little bit more about the uh, cohorts, but that might impact what your requirements are, but clinical education is a program that the part of the program that runs over the whole um, of BC and into rural and remote communities, urban communities, um, and a variety of settings. It's an opportunity to learn from your clients, their families, uh, communities, and the organizations in which you will work as well. Um, it's also a great opportunity to share what you have learned both in the MPT program and what you bring from your undergraduate degrees with the clients and communities and organizations that you work with. Um, and one of the great things about our program is that communities throughout BC benefit from having MPT students on placement. So who are MTT students? They come from a variety of backgrounds and life experiences. Um, we work hard to help make sure that we have a good representative representation of the BC population in terms of diversity. Uh, that's it. But certainly another important thing is they're hardworking and we recognize that in everything that you're doing now to try and help prepare yourself uh, for your application in the future. 
So as I mentioned earlier, we have distributed sites and we are growing. Uh, so in Point Grey, we have what's called the Vancouver cohort of students. So that's um, 80 students in the Friedman building. Uh, we have UNBC partnered with us for the MPTN cohort. Uh, we have another 20 students that are UBC students that are in the Fraser region, uh, in, the, in the Surrey area, and that's the cohort that I work with primarily. And then we have a new um, program, a new cohort of students starting in UVic. Uh, we're in the process of finalizing um, that part, that cohort, uh, but we, this is a new addition to the program that we are hoping to be part of uh, the admissions process for next year. So I'm going to chat a little bit more about each cohort themselves. So the MPTN cohort, was developed as there's a significant shortage of physios in northern and rural communities. This is a provincially funded initiative developed in partnership with UNBC, and it aims to increase recruitment and retention of physiotherapists to northern and rural areas. Uh, and the other benefit is that uh, people from communities in the north North and rural uh, are able to attend physio school closer to their home communities. So then we've got the Fraser Valley. Our new campus is located near Surrey Memorial Hospital, just five minutes away from where I am now, and will be ready in early 2024. And we're excited to move in there. Um, our focus on placements is within the Fraser region. And that's why I kind of talked about that caveat that although placements take place across the whole um, province uh, for distributed sites, there are some more geographical requirements around uh, where the clinical education will happen. Uh, so our placements are located, the majority of placements are in the Fraser Health region for Fraser Valley students. Um, so the other opportunity that you have is to consider a UBC MPT PhD dual degree program. Uh, so applicants apply in January for September admission and must complete separate applications for the MPT program and the RHSC PhD programs. By having them overlap together, it helps to provide students flexibility in the completion of the, the concurrent clinical and research training. Um, and it's an opportunity to integrate their clinical and research learning resulted in an accelerated completion time of approximately five years. So what are the opportunities for MPT graduates? Uh, so there's definitely opportunity around continued education and chosen area of practice. So when we see the outcomes of the MPT program, it means that you've met basic entry entry to practice requirements and you're considered a generalist. Um, so as you go through this and you find the areas of practice that Rowley mentioned, such as so many areas that you really enjoy, you can do uh, more education within those specific areas. You can also participate in research or be involved in health policy and leadership at many levels within organizations in uh, the province and other places as well, which links into you can work abroad. Um, when we look at physiotherapy licensure, we, we provide you with the degree that you would then take to licensing body. So that's what happens here in BC, that once you've completed our degree um, and then you've done the PCE that uh, Rowley talked about, you can then apply for a license in British Columbia and other places in Canada. But other countries will have other requirements, uh, so you need to be aware of that. But I myself have come from South Africa, so uh, physical therapists are needed in many different areas of the world as well. You can be flexible with your work times, depending on how and which kind of environment you work in. Uh, but one thing that is very clear is there are a lot of job opportunities, uh, and that's part of why we're expanding our seats, because there is a significant need for physical therapists, both in public and private sector within BC. I'm now going to hand over to our students. Uh, 
Um, all right, I can uh, start it off. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Rachel. I'm a second year in the Fraser Valley cohort. Um, still feels weird to say that I'm a second year because it feels like not too long ago I was attending these kind of information sessions too. Um, so far, I've had a really great experience in the uh, program. Um, <clears throat> it was a lot easier to make friends than I initially thought. Everybody comes in just really excited to like meet everyone and um, all that kind of stuff. I think that was like the biggest concern for me was I was like, I came into the program knowing nobody who got in. Um, so yeah, making friends, everybody was so lovely um, and it was great. Um, yeah, first year is difficult. <laughs> um, I, yeah, it's, you know, very academically challenging and your schedule is quite busy. Um, so getting past like the eight months was like my initial goal when I first got into the program. And then, um, you know, I feel like once you get your base or your foundation within that first year, um, you feel a lot more comfortable, you know, at this point in time, uh, we've been on two placements, um, and that has certainly helped with our education. Um, and yeah, I feel like a lot more, I guess, like established as a second year, knowing a little bit more um, and feeling a bit better. So um, yeah, I'm, there's a lot of like social opportunity, which is great. I personally chose uh, not to work during the program. Um, they recommend that you don't, and there is a good reason for that. Um, but I do know a couple people who have even, uh, who has still like taken on clients as they were with kin, as they were as like kins before coming in the program. Um, and I know a couple people who have worked kind of serving our waitress, um, type jobs as well. Uh, so something with a flexible schedule, I would definitely recommend if you were thinking of it, but, um, I was very happy personally with my decision to not work during the first year. Um, I know that people are looking at a couple more opportunities as uh, we get a bit more established in the program and you kind of figure out what you want to do um, and like the scheduling and uh, what's expected of you and that kind of thing. Um, so, yeah. I don't know if there's anything else you guys want me to expand on, but I, yeah, that's a general overview. <laughs> Thanks, Rachel. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Elena. I'm also a second year PT student in the Vancouver cohort. Um, I would say that this program has been equally challenging and rewarding all at the same time. It does definitely teach you a lot about yourself um, and your learning habits and your, I have found at least through the program that I'm a lot more capable of things that I never thought I would be capable of. Um, yeah, I did my undergrad in human kinetics, which is very similar to kinesiology. Uh, which definitely has been helpful, but there is many people in the program who don't have any sort of background in that at all and have come from all sorts of different degrees and we're all in a level playing field. And I will say that um, you do create a support system of, you know, in Vancouver, there's a hundred of us right now, 80 in the Vancouver cohort and 20 in Fraser. Um, and I will say you have a support system of 99 other people, which is pretty cool. Plus the faculty and staff. Um, Coming into the program, I was really excited and really nervous all at once. And like Rachel said, um, I definitely think that the first year is the most academically challenging, but it's only as hard as you make it on yourself. So again, you have that support system of people stay on top of your work and you'll be totally fine. Um, it has been super exciting to learn more and kind of see how many areas and avenues physio can take you down um, and really getting the opportunity to try everything and learn everything and implement things into practice while you're still learning has been really exciting. Um, so yeah, Rachel and I will be around if you have any questions for us. Awesome, thank um, you very much. Sorry, oh, sorry. go I'll ahead. I'll just add one quick tidbit um, about what Elena said. And uh, I would absolutely agree that the opportunities from being a physio are endless, um, I think. I came in thinking I had an idea of what a physio was and the, I guess, your ability to go into different areas of practice, whether that's public or private, are there's so many. And I think that's such a cool thing about this profession is, um, yeah, like all the opportunities you have to learn different things and different areas of work. So um, that's one thing I would really love to highlight is that it's really, really cool to be able to have those kind of opportunities. 
thanks. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, great. So, uh, Rachel and Elena are sticking around for the Q and A. So, absolutely do keep your questions for that. Um, uh, uh, we'll we'll get to that shortly. So, I'll move to the um, missions requirement section of the presentation. Uh, so, uh, to get into the program, you'll need a four year bachelor degree, uh, so 120 uh, credits approximately in any field. So as Elena mentioned, uh, it's really kind of a mix. There's certainly a lot of kin students in the program, but it's a mix of everything. Um, English competency is required if your degree wasn't taught in English uh, and a minimum overall average of 76% uh, in all your senior level courses is required. That is the uh, requirement that's set by the Faculty of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies. Um, and for the department, uh, you'll require a minimum of 72% uh, in all of your prerequisite courses. So those prerequisite courses are in no particular order, uh, physics, English, anatomy, psychology, statistics, and human physiology. And I should note that there are two uh, human physiology course requirements, one for basic and one for advanced uh, anatomy. And what we mean by basic is more uh, foundational. So courses that um, uh, teach foundational physiology. Um, in terms of residency, we do give preference to BC residents and grads, uh, as well as residents of uh, Yukon, uh, Northwest Territories, and Nunavut. Um, for volunteer and paid experience, you'll need 20 hours, uh, sorry, 70 hours of volunteer experience across no more than two facilities. And those will have uh, to include interactions with people that have cognitive, emotional, and physical disabilities. As well, you'll have to do the uh, CASPER test, um, which uh, they've changed their names a couple of times. <laughs> I should update the slide. They're no, no longer called Altus. I believe it's called Acuity now, uh, but the test is still called CASPER. Uh, and I think if you enter that, um, that URL there, takealtus.com, it still works. It's still the same test. And what that is, is a situational judgment test. Um, and uh, part of it is done through video recordings and through written answers. So the test is kind of divided into two sections. Uh, there are currently dates uh, available for the test from, from now until I think January. Uh, I highly recommend that you take a look at that sooner, sooner than later. Uh, and sign up for, for one of the uh, test dates. Uh, for references, you'll need two academic references uh, as well as one practical reference. So the practical reference has to be from the supervisor uh, where you had the most uh, volunteer hours. So if you if you just did one facility, then it would be that supervisor. But if you did two, it would have to be from the one where you have the, the most uh, supervisors. Uh, hours, sorry. Um, and I think usually, Gary, do you want to add anything here in terms of uh, references and uh, the application process? Yeah, so um, just to clarify something real quick that might not be on our website, but it is um, in, uh, has information within the online application itself, is that um, when you're uh, actually populating your application, your references will not be notified electronically at all until you actually submit the application. So the longer you wait to submit it, the less time you're gonna give your references. Um, if your references are feeling a little um, antsy, they wanna get their documentation in before you submit your application, that's fine. They're welcome to send it in via standard mail. Um, however, we unfortunately do not accept any reference materials hand delivered or sent via email. So do make sure that your references are aware of that. Um, another thing to mention is uh, you can submit your online application at any time after you fill out all the required fields. Um, and at that time is when you'll pay the application fee. Um, and then that's what will trigger the alerts to be sent out to your references. So just be aware of that. Um, but you do not have to have all your documentation added. And I feel like I'm jumping ahead, but this is kind of relevant. So um, all your documentation can be added later. So after you submit your application, 
you can then close it out, go back in, and then you can still upload documentation up until the January 15th deadline. Um, we just try to reiterate that so references can get their stuff in in a wider window of uh, time frame um, compared to just limiting it to only 10 days. Um, the only other thing I was going to mention real quickly is there is a very specific form that is on the to make sure your practical reference has and that they're aware they need to submit because that is part of the um, the uh, documentation we require for them to report on your volunteer experience, the populations you interact with, um, the duties you're performed and things like that. So do be aware that your practical reference should have that form. Um, and ultimately it is the applicant's responsibility to ensure that they're aware of that form. And I will let you... Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so very good points. Uh, so basically, your, for your academic references, uh, your referees are getting notified automatically and they submit through your online portal. But for your practical reference, you'll have to submit, uh, you, you'll have to uh, send the form to your refer referee uh, before they can submit it. So that's an important uh, thing to remember. Um, so in addition to the online application, uh, that you're filling for, for this program, you'll have to submit the MPT supplemental application form. Uh, so that includes a prerequisite information sheet. That's where you tell us all the prerequisites that you want to use uh, for the program. And then we'll go into your transcripts and make sure that everything matches up. Um, you'll have to list your, your volunteer experience or paid work experience and, and um, add more details about you know uh, what it is that you uh, were doing during that um, volunteer paid work experience as well as um, a written question response it's pro usually approximately 200 words and then finally you have a complimentary information section that's where you can tell us a, a little bit more about yourself uh, you know awards extracurricular activities employment history research training all that stuff um, and yeah, a common question for that one is in terms of extracurricular activities, we usually ask um, applicants to limit those to uh, your undergrad uh, extracurricular activities. So if you're going all the way back to high school, that's usually um, less favorable. Uh, so yeah, we, um, as Amy uh, mentioned earlier, we have, uh, you know, uh, four sites now across the province. Um, and there wasn't a slide for Victoria specifically, uh, just because it's still, it's we're definitely going to open applications for that and have students in 2024, but um, it's still kind of, you know, in the, in process. So I didn't want to add too much information there. Uh, but we, we can tell you that the first two years uh, will be located in the um, Victoria Tech Park. Um, while the facilities are built in uh, at, at UVic. Um, so in order to determine who goes where, uh, we have this site preference survey that is included on the online application form. Um, and there you can sort of tell us where you would prefer to be located. So um, it's pretty straightforward, but if you are choosing uh, MPT North because there's a supplemental application for that, um, we do ask that you make sure that you complete that if you choose it as one of your ranked sites. If you are totally able to just say not interested, if you don't want to do that, but I just wanted to mention it so that uh, you are aware that you do have to submit an additional form for that site, but you don't for any of the other sites. So that's the only one that you need to do that for. Um, and also this is very important. So site preference is really for you to decide, it's based on your, you know, it's a personal choice based on your situation, what your interests are. Um, it absolutely does not affect your ranking or your application in any way. So it's it's really just based on what your preference would be and where you would feel most comfortable studying. Uh, MPT GPA calculation. I'm sure we'll get many questions about this and I'll do my best to answer them all. Um, but I wanted to give a sort of just quick overview of what we consider for that. And so we use the last 30 credits of upper levels plus prerequisites. And that basically equals your MPT GPA. So in terms of your upper, le upper levels, uh, that's 
all, you know, 300 level or above. It does include master's or PhD level courses. So if you've done graduate courses, we will start with those because usually they're the latest courses you've taken. And then we'll go down until we've filled all 30 credits. Um, we consider the most recent um, to least recent courses, take it at any post-secondary institutions. So what I mean by that is that uh, we, we, we consider courses outside of the scope of your program. So if you're, let's say, a kin student, but you've taken one drama class at another university or something, and it, it's maybe drama is not the best uh, example, but you've taken another class at, you know, at a different university, if it does fall chrono chronologically within the latest 30 credits, we'll use that as well. So we, we use any course you know, at any institution. It's not just limited to um to your degree um so we do have a pretty long list of courses that we exclude and those are on the website so i'll just give a few uh, brief examples but um i do highly recommend that you look at the website because it's much more detailed and this is not intended to be like an exhaustive list uh but usually the most common ones that we exclude are practicums clinical placements uh thesis courses uh, and also, I didn't write it there, but directed studies are also pretty common. Um, so for prerequisites, we don't use all of the prerequisites. We only consider anatomy, physiology, statistics, and psychology in that calculation. So English and physics are not included, but you still need to have 72% in all of your prerequisites. So hopefully that makes sense. Um, for the interviews, we use the uh, MMI uh, process. Uh, so the MMI is intended to assess your communication skills, problem solving skills, maturity level, and your overall suitability for the uh, program and PT profession. So the MMI format is a series of in short interviews that you do consecutively. Um, our stations are eight, minute, eight minutes long, you have two minutes to read a scenario and then six minutes to answer. And once you're done with that, you just move on to the next station until you're done. So we have nine questions plus one break station where you're not doing anything. You're just relaxing. It takes some time to, to uh, compose yourself before your next interview. Uh, and yeah, that's it for MMIs. Important dates. So applications are currently open. They're going to close on January 5. Uh, the document deadline is 10 days after that on January 15. So um, documents are basically, you know, it's it's everything. It's uh, references, it's um, your MPT supplemental application. So everything that is, you know, required in the application that's not your online application is what we mean when we say, you know, document deadline. So Casper, all of that, as long as it's done, and submitted before January 15, you're good. Um, we do actually, I didn't update the presentation because we just recently found out our date for the MMI, but it will be on March 8th. So Friday, March 8th, and we will uh, update our website very soon to include that information as well. Um, if you are successful, then you can expect to have an offer uh, in May, June, around that time. For international students, if they're any of you here, uh, there are slightly different dates. So the application is closed on December 15, and uh, the document deadline is on January 10. Um, common questions uh, in terms of um, things that international students have to provide are proof of uh, English proficiency. And usually, if you studied um, outside of Canada, then you would need to provide uh, course reviews for all your prerequisites so that we make sure that they're equivalent. And just in case there are some, you know, uh, internationally trained physios, we also do have a program called Physio Refresh, and that is basically meant to help internationally trained physios uh, prepare for the uh, practical and written exam to become licensed physical therapists. So if that is you, then we can also um, help you uh, get there. Important reminders, um, make sure you meet all the minimum requirements. Uh, you don't want your application to be, uh, you know, not considered. Uh, so you want to make sure that uh, 
to uh, meet all those requirements. Um, make sure you start early, like Gary mentioned. You can go on the online application right now, check it out, read all the information, make sure that you understand everything. Um, and then check the reps website regularly. Uh, we do add some, you know, information on there about like the MMI or, you know, um, changes in, in our policies, things like that. Um, and feel free to ask questions. We usually reply to questions within 24 to 48 hours. Uh, so we're pretty quick uh, in that regard. We also have office hours uh, where you can book some time with either Gary or Sunny to ask some questions. So that's it for uh, the presentation. Uh, I guess we'll move on to this. Slide. Yeah, exactly. So Gary, oh, Amy, do you have a question? Yes, I just wanted to ask if we could go back to the, the slide of the uh, distributed sites. I wanted to speak a little bit to what learning looks like. Um, and I realized that we didn't cover that. This slide? Yes. Yeah. So the, the one big question is, is what does learning look like in a distributed program? Uh, so just to clarify that all the students cover the same academic content teaching will come from one of the sites. So for example, when I teach my content, I will teach from the Fraser, Fraser Valley cohort. And then that's connected via screens in the labs or lecture theaters, depending on the type of teaching that's happened. And that same content is then broadcast to the other sites. Um, so there isn't any uh, difference in how, in what content is delivered. There may be differences in terms of what percentage of teaching is from that site, because uh, faculty from the Fraser site will teach from the Fraser site, faculty in Vancouver will teach from Vancouver. Um, but we do have a lot of work that goes into making sure that we give a, an equitable experience to all of the students in the different cohorts. Um, but teaching is a blend of watching uh, the lecture or the lab over the screens in the venue that you're in and um, also having the instructor with you. Uh, for labs where you have the instructor in a different site, you will have what we call CSA, so that's clinical skills assistance. They're with you in the room to help with learning the skills that are being structured. So uh, just to get that reassurance that you, wherever you are in the program, uh, if your instructor, instruct, primary instructor's com, instruction is coming from another site, you will still have hands-on support from physiotherapists uh, that come in and help uh, with practicing your clinical skills. Just wanted to add that. That is very good information, actually. Thanks for, for including that. Uh, okay, Gary, I will uh, let you share. Uh, can you? Oh, never mind. Uh, one thing I did want to mention while I'm sharing my screen, too, is that we do currently have office hours, but uh, typically around mid mid uh, December, we do halt them until um, maybe like a bit later in the spring, only because that's our very busy time of year. Um, so if you are... Um, interested in booking one, you can just find it on the admission requirements section of our website. Um, and then we have a, typically two days a week that are available to people to book an appointment. Otherwise, if you have kind of a quick email email type question, uh, mpt.admissions is how you can get a hold of us. Um, we do our best to respond to everyone within a 24 hour, uh, 48 hour window, sorry. Um, not including weekends, obviously. Um, Oh, okay, so we already got some questions popping up. Um, you're welcome to also upvote anything you you also are interested in learning more about. Um, but I'm just gonna let this kind of think for a second. Um, yeah, but I, I will answer, yeah, I'll, uh, go ahead. Oh, sorry, Gary. I, I, uh, I also just wanted to add that uh, we, we do want to get to all the admissions questions, but if you have questions about the program for Amy or Roly or the students, I highly encourage you guys to ask those because that Gary and I are available to ask, answer your questions all the time. So <laughs> we're there, but they're only here today. So uh, please feel free to ask them questions. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um. 
Lori, do you want to tackle this one on the top here? What criteria separate successful from non-successful applicants in the N into the MPT program? Um, kind of a loaded question to. <laughs> no, I mean it's it's a it's a good question. Uh, yeah. I think you know obviously making sure you meet the requirements. Uh, you know, uh, GPA is uh you know an important part of the application, but so are interviews, and. You know, in those interviews, you have a chance of, um, you know, highlighting uh, your past experiences and why you want to be a physio and, you know, uh, communication, professionalism, leadership, critical thinking, um, uh, empathy. Uh, you know, all, those are all things that we're looking for in a physical therapist. And um, yeah, maybe the maybe Amy or the students want to add something there. Uh, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, recognize, I think that grounding is um, the important is that there's the prereqs and then we look at all of that. I think, though, that we also want to recognize that working with people, working with health sciences, it's not just about a GPA. It's also about how you're going to both be successful yourself in the profession, uh, but also how you work with people and consider um healthcare as a profession uh, so we do take that into account as we're um, reviewing the applications um i'll go ahead and get this next uh top question here if i'm currently taking a prerequisite course do i have to wait until my final mark before submitting my application um, no, you can submit an application now, but the prereqs should be completed by December 31st because you do have to upload um, both the supplemental application form in which you note the final grade and also the transcript confirming the um, final grade as well for that specific term. So if you're applying and you're currently taking classes um, this term, then you do want to wait to request your official transcripts until all your grades from the September to December term are visible. Um, and then you would need to get that uploaded before the January 15th deadline. Um, yeah, so that's that's what I would say, generally speaking. Um, Louis has highlighted a question for the current students. Um, if you, uh, Elena and, and Rachel, want to uh, respond to that, what, what inspired you to pursue physio? Yeah, I can go first. Um, fortunately for me, I was one of those very lucky people that knew what they wanted to do basically right away from high school. Uh, I was an athlete, like I think lots of people are when they want to be part of physio. And my very first um, sports injury. I was 13 and it was an upper uh, hip flexor injury, which was really uncomfortable for a 13 year old to have to kind of experience in physio in physiotherapy. And I thought I could do that. I think, I think I could be able to do it. And my brother um, is uh, a rehabilita rehabilitation specialist as well in massage therapy. And I thought it was really interesting. So I went to kinesiology and I loved it. And then I learned that I really liked working with children. And so I came into the program. I did a pediatric placement. And as of right now, my goals are kind of to work in the public health spectrum, hopefully with children and maybe more long-term care, like palliative or oncology. But um, my goals in the program are to try everything. And I really recommend trying everything. Uh, it's good to have a passion, but also don't shut your options down or limit yourself just to one thing the whole entire time. The best part about the program is that you get the opportunity to experience everything. So if you don't know what you want to do right now, it's okay because you don't have to know and it changes all the time. Uh, but if you do know what you want to do, make sure that you're not limiting yourself to just one avenue. Really make sure that you're trying everything once you uh, get into the program. I'll let Rachel go. Um, yeah, I was an athlete when I was younger too, um, and into university. So I did my undergrad in Ken. Um, I'm not entirely sure looking back why I chose Ken, but I'm very grateful that I did. Um, and yeah, I worked as a kinesiologist for two years after I graduated from my undergrad and I loved it. I loved working with people. I loved, uh, using the knowledge I learned in school. I, yeah, just loved helping people get better in a kind of like more exercise focused way. And, um, but I found I was getting 
limited as a kin with my scope of practice and the education that I got um, and had and was trying to kind of do that. Um, so I wanted to pursue, pursue further education so I could help, you know, people more. And um, physio was kind of always in the back of my head when I was in like the kin program in undergrad. But um, ultimately, when I was working as a kin, that just kind of reinforced the decision that this was definitely something I wanted to do. Um, and, you know, I, I tell everybody who asks me, oh, how's school going? Or like, do you like the program? It's always, this is the program itself is everything that I wanted to learn um, when, you know, I was working as a kin and I, I wanted to expand my scope of practice. It was, yeah, this is, this was it. And so it's really nice to have that um, kind of, yeah, be a reality and get all these practical skills and learn all these specific ways on how to help people and different populations and, um, you know, like different injuries and all that kind of stuff. So um, I personally am unsure of where I want to practice. My next placement is at a pelvic floor private clinic, um, which is definitely, you know, an area I've considered. So women's health is a big one for me. Um, so yeah, I might be able to tell people more after my next placement, but, um, I've had a lot of really great experiences in neural placements as well. So, uh, working with stroke patients and, uh, incomplete spinal cord, which has been very interesting. So, yeah. Thank you very much. Um, actually there was another question. Oh, it just went away, but they were, they were asking, how did you both from your perspective, how did you prep for the MMI? Um, I was very, very lucky to have a friend um, that had gotten into the program a year before me. And so she kind of helped me out with some, I guess, like tips and tricks on how to enter the interview in an organized fashion. Um, so, you know, having like a guideline on how to answer questions um, was very, very helpful. Um, there were, there was an ethics undergrad course. Um, I went to UBC Okanagan, um, and there was an ethics kin course, um, that kind of provided a really great guideline, um, for how to answer, you know, like these MMI type questions. And, um, another friend of mine who was also applying in the same year, um, she got in as well. She's in the Northern program. Um, we went on zoom and just talked through questions. So, you know, I would, we would do the timer and um, we'd take sample questions from the internet and we just like talk through our thought process. And I would probably say that that was the most helpful thing was just hearing somebody else's answer. So like hearing my friend's answers and then also um, answering for myself and giving each other feedback and working together really, really helped. And we both got in, which was great. Um, but yeah, if you, if you have some friends that would help. I think that's a great yeah. way to do it. <laughs> Generally speaking, I think the the advice we typically give applicants is to just practice the sort of format with the rapid question with a sort of timer going so you're able to, you know, prepare just for the format of the and the structure of the MMI itself. Um, but thank you very much for your for your uh, answer. Um, uh, this top question here, what is a competitive GPA? Uh, I think you're asking what is the actual percentage most likely is what I would assume you're asking. Um, generally speaking, it was covered in the in the uh, presentation that that is uh, both included uh, uh, based on your most recent 30 upper level credits and also the those selected prerequisite courses. Um, generally speaking, that's a kind of difficult question to answer in terms of what percentages there are for people who get in because it does vary depending on the applicant pool of a given cycle. Um, so I can't really, uh, unfortunately, provide any more information about specific percentages. Um, but yeah, on the interview and program entry section of our website is where we have a breakdown, a more detailed breakdown of how we do the GPA calculation generally. Um, so we got that one already as well. Um, questions about weighting uh, and what's what's weighted GPA versus everything else. Unfortunately, we can't provide any any information about that. That's kind of more of an internal admissions committee um, review process, so we don't really divulge that information publicly, unfortunately. 
Um, but I will go down to this next question here. If a prereq falls within the most recent 30, would it be used again? Uh, no, if a course is being used for a prerequisite, it would not also be used in the upper 30, even if it is an upper level course, because we would only count it. Um, yeah, and I, I, I think for the first question here, uh, if I'm currently taking a prereq course, do I have to wait until I get my final mark before submitting my application? So it's a bit of a, your, your prereq course has to be finished by December 31st. Um, and so you kind of just have to make sure that that course, uh, that your grade appears in your transcript when you submit it uh, before January 15th. So it's, it's a bit of a, you know, you have to make sure that happens. Um, once in a while, uh, universities, you know, or they, they can go on strike sometimes or for whatever reason, the professors don't provide grades on time. Those situations are very rare, but usually uh, I would say 98% of applicants are able to get their grades in uh, on time by January 15th. Yeah, and another thing to mention too about that is ideally you'll get a official paper transcript sent to yourself so you can scan it front and back or pick up a copy from your university registrar. Or we do accept official electronic, um, but you do want to make sure that your transcript does say official. Anything unofficial will not be accepted for any reason. Um, Similarly, any sort of online uh, screenshot of your unofficial results from your university, that would also not be acceptable. So uh, within the online application, it does specify that. It also is stated on our website as well. Um, there's a question about academic references. Generally speaking, the good rule of thumb is, did this person play a role in an instructor capacity and are they able to speak to your overall academic abilities and qualifications and do they also play a part in your overall assessment in your performance for that cl uh, class so yes a lecturer would be fine to serve as a as an academic reference um, as well as the uh, uh, you know a, a professor or assistant professor or any any professor uh, rank um, so that would be fine uh, Rachel and Elena, how did you prepare for CAFR? Yeah, I can touch on that. Um, for Casper, like similar to Rachel, I was also at UBC Okanagan and there was an ethics course, which was really helpful because we did do some um, ethics-based practice questions, which was similar to Casper. But I think the thing that helped me the most was doing the practice Casper test online. Um, I'm not sure if they still offer it, but there is a practice one. And it gets you really used to the format of writing the questions and having to answer quickly. Now it could have, the test could have changed over the last couple of years, but when I took it, it was all typing based. Um, so just getting used to the rapid fire of having to answer a question and think critically uh, to answer. And uh, I think that was the thing that helped me the most to prep. But similar to the MMI, you can't really, like for me, you can't really guess what's going to be on the exam or on the interview or whatever they're asking you. Um, you can't really guess what's going to be on it. You can be prepared for how to answer certain questions, but they change all the time. Um, so just getting used to the format, I think, is what was the most helpful for me. I would also agree. I think that taking the practice Casper test was the best thing I could have done to help prepare for it. Um, and typing quickly was also another one. <laughs> um, Louis, would you mind clearing out those two? I can only see the, the Slido. You mean the the, the ones uh, below the first questions? But, yeah, the yeah. one about the references, we got that. Oh. Will fall 2023 applications be able to choose Victoria? Yeah, so uh, if you look at the online application now, there is the site preference survey located in the online application of which we did include Victoria as an option to for you to provide your overall ranking as to which site you prefer. Um, we already answered this prereq in the most recent 30 question as well. Sorry, it's kind of clunky because when I upvote a question, it just 
erases the previous question, so you might have missed it. But what inspired Rachel and Elena to uh, pursue physio is kind of a new one. And I know you guys already talked a little bit about this, but you know, if you have anything to to add, please feel free to do so. No, they they got that oh, right. You, you guys got it. Oh, sorry, yeah. I must have been too focused on looking for questions for them. <laughs> sorry. Um. When should the CASPER test be completed? On any of the designated dates for UBC MPT, um, I believe the last one is January 10th, if I'm not mistaken, but that's that would be, you need to look at their website specifically. We, we purposely do not put their dates on our website because they have been known to be shifted at some point. So we don't want to provide anyone with incorrect information. Um, so any of the specific dates uh, for UBC Master Physical Therapy would be fine. Um, and then, sorry, Louis, do you mind? I think all these top questions are all have all been answered, the upvoted ones. Uh, is practical experience in a physio clinic or clinical experience in a physio environment favored? No. What I would stress is you you primarily want to have your volunteer experience focus on direct interaction with people with emotional, physical, or cognitive disabilities. So that is key. Um, what you, you know, that could be included in those settings and that's fine, but that's not, we don't, I don't, there's no hierarchy in terms of what is viewed more favorably in terms of that. So you just want to make sure that your experience does focus on those specific uh, populations. Um, and then again, your practical reference will serve, uh, your direct supervisor from that experience will serve as your practical reference and then they'll be able to report on that experience as well. Um, I think I also did see uh, a question about what Elena and I did for our like work slash volunteer experience. Um, and I saw that there were quite a few questions on that. So for me personally, I uh, volunteered with the Special Olympics in Kelowna um, for on and off for a number of years in my undergrad and also my work experience as a kin prior to applying also um, counted towards that. So those were kind of my big two when I that I used when applying. I don't know if that helps anyone. <laughs> Yeah, and then um, I volunteered with a kinesiologist in Kelowna as well, uh, just working in her clinic and seeing a variety of patients, which was my big one for my volunteer hours. But um, I will also say outside of that, uh, just talking about my general work experience, I taught dance for a number of years, which was uh, pretty helpful as well. Like I didn't get to count it as my volunteer work experience hours, but I did get to put it um, on my little, my resume saying that I taught dance and worked with with people prior. So um, I think that helped me a little bit as well, just to be prepared for the um, person to person interaction throughout the program. Thank you. Um, Amy, I actually have a question here for you. Are international placements available? Yes, so that's a good hot topic. Um, we used to do international placements, uh, but they were put on hold because of COVID. And we just started um, opening up that opportunity again, because obviously travel was restricted during COVID. Um, and we have a site that we're working with because we have to establish agreements with sites. Uh, so all of those agreements kind of lapsed over the time of COVID when we weren't sure when we would move forward. Uh, so it is something that we are working on. The big caveat, it's not United States, it's not Hawaii. That's always the hot, the hot, the hot question. Can we do a placement in Hawaii? <laughs> um, it's international placements are focused on global and population health. Uh, so they're usually in uh, community settings. So that's the, the caveat to international placements. Thank you very much. Um, MMI over Zoom. I don't know that that's been fully decided upon at this time. So, but we will be sure to update our website after that is officially determined. So for now that we're gonna put a pause on that question. Um, I do see one about the uh, written statement uh, that's located within the supplemental form. Would it be better to focus on one or two or broader answer encompassing three to four? I'm going to let you answer that question yourself because that is for you to determine. Unfortunately, um, yeah. So I would, I would, whatever you think is best. Um, 
that's also a chance for the applicants to kind of convey to the committee who they are. Um, so I wouldn't want to provide you with any information or guidance in terms of how you should present yourself. That would be for you to determine. Um, when will students be entering the Victoria cohort? I believe that is that is planned. Really, would we 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 be okay saying any yes. information about timelines? I th well, I think right now our messaging is that we are accepting applications into the Victoria program for 2024, but things are still waiting to be uh, finalized. But from a student, from a uh, applicant perspective. Um, yes. Yeah. So that would be September 2024 program start ideally. Um, but again, we'll have stuff on our website if anything changes and this is all pending approval. Um, so do be aware of that as well. Um, what factors are being taken into consideration after the interview? Will we just be Will it just be the interview score or a blend of everything? Mm, again, sorry, can't really answer that question, unfortunately. So uh, that would be just uh, based off of the admissions committee overall review after the interview. Um, apologies, we can't provide any more information about that question. Um, oh, this one's actually a very good one. And I kind of touched on this earlier. Uh, looking for clarification, we can submit our application early and edit it afterwards by adding documents such as supplemental document. Yes. Any document can be added to a submitted uh, application. That includes your MPTN supplemental form, the general supplemental form, official transcripts, um, your BC services card, all that stuff. What I would say, though, is your responses within the online application will become read-only, so those are not editable. I think the only thing you can change is um, if for some reason you needed to adjust a reference or update their email address or things like that. One thing to mention, too, with a reference, always try to get an organizational email address because the online application portal will not support references submitting anything if they use a free web-based email account, such as Gmail or Yahoo or whatever is being used nowadays. I still have a Yahoo, hilariously. Um, but yeah, so do be aware of that. Um, but yes, you can absolutely add documents. I think it may require you to like actually log out of the portal and then log back in in order to then allow you to attach documents. But, I often haven't, I don't fully understand um, what it's like from the applicant perspective a lot of times because I've never actually submitted one. So visually, I don't see what it looks like um, from your perspective, but I believe that's the case and there will be instructions on there as well. Yeah, I kind of put a, that new question up there for maybe Roly or Amy. I know that, um, you know, you can maybe speak a little bit to how, how the program differs from other programs maybe or, yeah. Um, I can give it a go. I, I don't know what the current uh, approach is for um, Australia's programming. And, and I also, again, I think, you know, hands-on uh, could be interpreted very, very differently. So I think having, you know, myself trained in England and worked with many Australian physios and uh, uh, Amy's uh, trained in, in different countries as well, I, I think most of the Western physiotherapy programs um, are very similar in terms of, of education. I think maybe maybe different countries have a bit more of a prominent research focus. So there's certainly some, some prominent uh, hands-on or manual therapy based researchers in Australia, um, but I wouldn't say that necessarily um, offers big differences in, in, in programming between um, most Western countries. All right, thank you. Um, Amy, actually, would you be able to tackle this question about the volunteer requirement? What would you uh, say falls underneath the umbrella of physical disability? Uh, I mean, that's a, it's a very broad, it, it's a, exactly what they talk about in um, the description, recognizing, so it's, it's anything that impacts their ability to function um, is, is how we kind of broadly 
link in function within um, that would be my but it, it's yeah, that, yeah. it's a broader sense of disability. Yeah, also what I would add to that, I see a lot of questions in here about like, I work in a physical therapy, would, would my you know work experience be uh, counted? And so the first thing to that is that Gary or I, nobody during the admissions process um, decides anything about that. That is up to the admissions committee to review and assess if the volunteer experience uh, fits our requirement. Um, if you're, you know, and, you know, so, Gary, or I can't tell you if it's good or not, but if you have doubts, what we recommend is that you ask your supervisor to clarify what it is exactly that you did to engage with people that have disabilities during your placement. So, you know, if it's not um, obvious, because you could very well be working in a physical therapy clinic and mostly doing just clerical duties, or maybe it's like a hyper sports focused clinic, you know, then no, those things might not count. So um, you really want to make sure that you clarify that in your in your statement for your volunteer experience, both in your own statement and maybe asking your reference to do that as well. So that is the best way for you to make sure that that gets counted. And, and that's just what I wanted to kind of add in and highlight. It's not like working with sports people to enhance function. It's um, the ability to function within the environment. Awesome. Thank you very much. Um, how are students selected for interviews? Is it meeting the minimum requirements or does it also go further into having a competitive application? Uh, it is stated on our website that meeting the minimum requirements is not guaranteeing interview. Ultimately, it is going to be uh, interview offers will be sent out to, you know, based off of what the admission committee uh, has selected, who they have selected for the interviews. Um, generally speaking, yeah, it's kind of, that's also a very difficult question to answer because there's so many factors. We do have the applications reviewed holistically, so they don't just look at GPA, they don't just look at um, prerequisites, they don't just look at volunteer experience, they look at the entire thing as a whole complete package. So, um, yeah, it's a very challenging question to answer, unfortunately. Um, if you're waitlisted for the MPT program, when would you be notified? Uh, that, generally speaking, we don't typically uh, provide waitlisted candidates with what rank they're in, in terms of the waitlist. Um, so ultimately, a waitlisted candidate would only be notified if a spot becomes available to them. So generally speaking, that would be anywhere from, I would say, May until um, mid to late August. Uh, once orientation week starts, then there would be absolutely no more movement on the wait list because we do want to make sure our incoming students have started and they attend orientation week. Um, you want me to take that highlighted one? Yeah, so um, no, no, you can um, obviously like both Amy and myself, um, you can work in BC if you've trained somewhere else. The the distinction to work in BC is passing the uh, the British Columbia College requirement. So so passing the exam that um, that province um, accepts essentially, and then different provinces now have slightly different requirements, and different countries have slightly different requirements. So so you need to pass uh, the the program, but then you also need to pass that provincial kind of practice licensure if that makes sense. Thank you. Thank you, Roy. Um, this question about Physics 12. Yes, absolutely. If you're using uh, Physics 12, you absolutely need to have a high school transcript, which is noted on our website, as well as the online application. Typically, the most common one we see is from the BC Ministry of Education, assuming you took this, course, uh, this class in BC um, or whatever provincial um, Ministry of Education you have, uh, depending on where you took that class or Physics 30 um, out of province. Uh, yes, we have seen TAs serve as academic references, again, because they are able to speak to your academic abilities and qualifications. They, you know, were able to, they played a role in your overall assessment. Um, 
I don't know that that would be necessarily boundary one, but uh, again, that would be up for you to determine who you select to be your academic reference. One thing I, to mention too, anyone in a staff position, like a coach or an academic advisor would not be ideal and not acceptable for an academic reference. So yeah, I do, and I, you kind of said it, Gary, but I do want to say for TAs, there are like two different types of TAs. Some play a very passive role. It absolutely has to be a TA that has evaluated you and that has taught you in the class. So they have like a certain percentage of you know the the your time in class has to have been taught by the TA. So if it's yeah, uh, if so, I would just be careful with that and and maybe only use a TA if like that is um your best option uh what is absolutely recommended though is that you get your references from your professors uh louis actually do you want to take this top question there oh yeah uh so yeah so victoria is well underway we're very confident about it of course there's still some things to finalize um I don't know what would happen exactly if that were the case, but um, you know, it's it's. I don't think we we can speculate on that at this point. I just I'm just going to say that it you know it is well underway, and we are accepted accepting students to apply for this because um, you know we're very confident it will happen. So I don't I don't think it's um, you should be worrying about that. Yeah. Also, if you you know if you're going to get an offer and for some reason Victoria were to fall through which I don't anticipate but you never know um, we still would refer to the other uh, sites you ranked as second or third assuming you're talking about having Victoria noted as your first preference um, so yeah we do our best to accommodate first preferences but that unfortunately is not always the case just depending on how many um, students also said that for their first preference. So, but we do our best to try and accommodate everyone's first uh, ranked choice. Um, I'm going to answer this question about Brazil. Generally speaking, what I would suggest you look at is the check your eligibility section of the UBC Faculty of Graduate and Postdoctoral Studies website because they have. Uh, criteria for applicants from uh, every single country across the planet. So if you can just check that and then, you know, it'll tell you what the minimum requirements are for people who completed degrees from that specific country. So I would, I would recommend reaching out to that. Um, what percent of seats are reserved for out of province? Uh, that I would say, generally speaking, about 10% of our current students were out of province applicants. Um, again, as Louis mentioned during his presentation, we do prioritize BC residents, uh, applicants who are out of province but completed a degree within in BC within the last five years or residents of the territories because we are the only MPT program in BC. Um, but generally speaking, I would say currently about 10% of our current students are out of problems or were out of problems. Um, Elena and Rachel, there's a question here for both of you or either of you. Um, can you please explain more about the different avenues of physio, potential options for workplaces or scopes of practice? Or maybe um, that's also, uh, any questions? I don't know, I'll have to stop, sorry. <laughs> Um, well, for placements, at least, I think that's a good representation of kind of where we can go. Um, so yeah, there's like outpatient physio in a hospital, there's community health, so going into people's homes, there's geriatric, um, so working uh, with an older community, um, there's oncology, like Elena uh, mentioned earlier. Um, you know, there's inpatient neuro, there's inpatient surgery, there's acute units, there's um, just tons, like even just in pel public health itself. Um, and then you have your private, um, you know, private kind of clinic side. So more, I guess, uh, like working in a clinic and they have their own specialties. Like there's been a couple 
sports specific ones, concussion specific ones, uh, again, like more, I guess, like neuro concussion. Um, like I said, I'm going to a, pub, a pelvic floor health clinic um, in November. So that's a different area of practice. Um, yeah, there is, I feel like the answer to that is infinite. Um, yeah. And then, you know, there are opportunities to do a split placement or I'm sorry, a work both in public and in private. Um, I was following one of my preceptors who did, you know, two or three days a week in public health. So working on um, an acute surgery floor in a hospital and then uh, three days a week working in a private clinic. Um, and that was really cool to see. So yeah, endless options. <laughs> Elena, I don't know if you want to expand on that. Yeah, I think you covered most of it. Um, and I think Amy might be more knowledgeable on some of the more specifics of some of the areas of physio. But for me, what I've noticed is that physio kind of has its little hand on every part of healthcare. It's always kind of there. Like there's there's options for everything. Um and so much more specialized and complex, the further you go, you realize that you can be involved in so much. So like Rachel said, uh, all areas of the hospital, inpatient or outpatient, there's usually some sort of physiotherapy practice happening. Then you get into private and then you think about a normal physio clinic where you go in for your general injuries, but then there's specializations on top of that. So um, really it's ever expanding. And I, I don't know if Amy wants to add anything else because she's much more knowledgeable than I think the two of us. But. Right. I, I love you. I love your perspectives. The, the one thing that I would just add is it's also across different uh, spans of the life. So everything from teeny tiny little neonatal um, infants in the NICU uh, all the way up to, to geriatrics, um, as Rachel mentioned. So pediatrics is also part of our, our practice as well. Um, and then the other big one that I like to increase awareness around is the cardiorespiratory, so working with lungs, because um, that's my area of special interest, and I find that it's an area that not many people are aware of as they come into uh, the physiotherapy uh, degrees. Um, so I, but I think the great, one of the amazing things about physio is you also don't have to stick to one area of practice. You can start uh, saying, I want to work in hospitals or in this with the neurological population. And then at some point in your degree, because you have that general uh, entry to practice degree, you can say, okay, now I want to go into sports um, and then change directions as well. So I think that's the other thing. It's there are many opportunities and you can change your mind along the way as you experience different things. There was a question that did disappear, but it was related to placements as well. But was there a specific sports placement available in MPT? I think that's what the question was. I don't see it in front of me, unfortunately. So it's not a requirement to do a sports yeah. placement. Uh, what placements are available depend on what we have offered at the time. Uh, so if there is a sports clinic that offers a placement, then that does come up as an opportunity, but um, it isn't a requirement. It just depends on the opportunity opportunities available at the time uh, and also how many student, students are selecting it if we only have one or two and we have 50 students that want that placement not everyone would be guaranteed a placement in that area. Gotcha thank you very much. Um, going back to some prereq related questions no you cannot use grade, phys, uh, grade 11 physics unfortunately grade 12 would be the minimum level um, you can use that would be acceptable. Additionally, no prerequisite course would expire, although I will say that it's probably more beneficial for the applicant to have taken their prereqs more recently, only because the content covered in prereqs would often be carried over into the MPT program curriculum. So you do want to kind of keep that in mind when applying. Um, for example, anatomy, I know that that's a class that the students um, start right right away within the program. So something like that would be ideal to have more recent, just so the information is more fresh in your mind. Uh, but on the FAQ page of our website, it does explicitly say that prereqs do not expire. Um, do academic references still need to be employed by the university? Uh, sort of. So anything from high school level no unfortunately that wouldn't be acceptable that's even noted by the ubc faculty of graduate and postdoctoral studies um i have 
seen and heard a few applicants who had completed their degree some time ago. Um, if you had pursued, if you were working in a professional setting and you had to do some sort of extensive training for that, it could be that the, 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 the instructor from that training could potentially serve as an academic reference, but um, that's not a super common one. The most common we see is just from post-secondary settings. Um, but again, employed by the university, again, staff, uh, coach, or student uh, academic advisor would not be acceptable. It needs to be someone who was in an instructor role. Um, Gary, if, can I add another interpretation to that question? I think, sure. so for example, if they've left the institution, so say I was working at UBC and I taught you at UBC and now I've gone somewhere else or I've mm -hmm. retired, I think that's what the question's asking as well. Like if they're no longer oh. still employed. So yeah, I mean, the answer would if, be that yes. first, if that instructor retired, but they can still, you know, they can actually still serve as your academic reference because they did teach you in that class that you did take. So that's, that's actually not. Obvious. Yeah, but they, they will need to use their institutional emeritus email because uh, personal emails aren't accepted. Correct. Or, yeah. so or the institution of the new institution. Or the new that institution. At. Yeah. If yeah. they're, yeah. That's fine. Otherwise, again, if there's any, that's the other reason too why we recommend people submit their applications early because you often do run into tech issues specifically for the references as well. So that's why if you wait till January 5th and then your references have tech issues and they only have a 10 day window, it gets a little tense and stressful. Get your application in sooner if possible. Otherwise, alternatively, like I said before, a reference can mail in their documentation be a standard mail, we will hold on to it. And then once we see you submit the application, we'll go and, and scan it and upload it uh, on their behalf, which would then trigger an alert to their applicant that it was received. Um, Amy, there's another placement question. For yeah, you. just highlighted that one, yeah. Yeah, so with all of our distributed, uh, so we don't have the person that's leading clinical education on Victoria, um, right now, so I can't give you hard and fast uh, numbers, uh, but I can tell you that it is the majority of placements within uh, the Vancouver Island area, which is a similar to what we've um, applied in the Fraser region, which is different to the Northern and rural cohort. They have not just, they have the geographic distribution of the Northern, but they also have that uh, requirement around rural, which can be in different spaces, uh, but it's just the majority of placement, but it doesn't, it can be all if you want, uh, but it can, you can also consider placements in other areas. Thank you very much. So um, I just, I sorry, Gary, um, we're, we're approaching time. We've been, um, doing the Q&A for over 30 minutes. So I just want to, yeah, we'll maybe answer a couple more questions and then shut it down. Um, does that sound I, good? Yeah. Yeah, that sounds great. I was actually going to tackle this one about uh, if you only indicate one preferred site. So I would generally say the rule of thumb is please only indicate where you actually would be willing to go or want to go. Um, I don't think it's wise for an applicant to input yes for something they're not genuinely interested in, um, because it could be that we couldn't accommodate the first request. So then they, you know, would it would potentially go to their second. Not ideal, but it has, you know, it, it might happen, unfortunately, just because of the, the number of spots available. So I would not suggest people input interest in a site that they're genuinely not interested in. And I don't think that that would necessarily decrease, decrease their chances of being accepted. That's that's a bit of a different um, sort of question, I guess. Um, do you want to answer the last question or the last couple? Or do you want me to tackle any more? Sure, I could do it. One, um, let, let, let's say I'll, I'll answer the um... uh the the one about the outer province because i've seen that um multiple times but uh basically we don't have a set number of students for outer province we do focus on bc students so about we accept about 90 percent of our student pool from uh, bc residents or students that have studied in bc in the last five years 
or um, uh, candidates that are from the territories. Uh, and then usually out of province, uh, students make up about 10% of our student pool. But it, there's no like hard limit or anything like that. It's just what it usually ends up being. Um, so yeah, so I guess I guess that's it for now. We uh, we got 110 questions. So obviously we didn't get through all of that. But <laughs> like I said, Gary and I, we do this every day and we are more than happy to keep answering your quest questions by email or in student uh, or in office hours. Uh, so please, if we didn't answer your question today, please um, write to us, yes, at npt.admissions at ubc.ca and we'll get back to you. Uh, special thanks to Rachel and Elena. I think you guys have assessments of some sort today. So thank you very much for, you know, taking time out of your busy schedules to do this. We really appreciate it a lot. And also, of course, Roly and Amy, uh, you guys are great. <laughs> it's always nice to have you here and answer the tougher questions that Gary and I can answer. Um, so that's it. Yeah, thanks very much, everyone. And uh, yeah, we'll see you soon. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.